Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part 7 of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis continuing from chapter 14 MI5 are listening. The lift doors opened to reveal another reception area. This one was smaller with dim lighting but not in any way less grand. The floor unlike the rest of the building was of a shiny black marble and tiled using tessellating irregular pentagons. The walls were lined with a golden network of irregular tessellating shapes inlaid into the walls. The ceiling too, I noticed, was decorated with a similar style. It gave the impression of being inside an ice cave. In front of us, just before you entered the bar itself, was a small desk. Hello and welcome to Ozone, said a smartly dressed receptionist. On the desk in front of her sat a black miniature schnauzer. He tried to smile, showing his front teeth in a rather unnerving way. I know the feeling. Dogs can't really smile like humans. Just at that very moment, there came a buzz from Jeff's pocket. It's the, you know, other phone, I tried to say without sounding suspicious. You'd better see what it says. It could be important. Yes, Jeff agreed. Excuse me a minute, he said to the receptionists. He took a step back from the desk and pulled out the device. It's a text, look. He turned the spy phone towards me, and I saw the text said, I'm going to ring you in 30 seconds. Make sure you cannot be overheard. We both stepped away from the reception desk and stood together. Jeff shuffled beside and then behind a tall plant pot. It smelled very dusty, and the crumbs on the floor showed that someone had been secretly munching biscuits here. The phone, which was on silent, rang its rhythmic buzz. Jeff crouched down to me and tried to make sure that I could hear too. Hello, gentlemen, the voice said, which I instantly recognised as that man behind the newspaper. We've been tracking you closely, and we know that you're about to enter the meeting place. You must not be seen by anyone at the meeting. Have you brought your disguises? Good fellows, be careful that the glue holding the moustaches on doesn't come loose in the heat. You must get as close as you can without raising any suspicions. We wish you to try and record your conversations you hear, because we need these as evidence later. On your phone is an app called MI5 Can Hear You. Activate the app and leave the phone turned on in your pocket when the meeting begins. We will be able to hear everything. I do mean everything, so be careful when you go to the toilet. That is all. Good luck. Oh, enjoy the light show if you are still here at 8 o'clock. It's rather good. The man behind the newspaper cut the connection, and Jeff activated the app called MI5 Can Hear You. The on function was a big red button in the centre of the screen. I'll turn it on when the meeting starts, he said. Right, well, let's go in, I said, pretending to be cheerful, in a way I didn't feel. We walked towards the receptionists again. They both smiled at us, and the lady indicated, with her arm gesture, for us to walk into the bar. The inside was decorated in the same way as the reception area, but even more so. It really did feel as if you were inside a giant ice cube or a cave. Maybe this was, it, was what it felt like to be in a cloud. The low purple lightning and the icicle-like hangings all contributed to the effect. But it was the windows on the wall outside, opposite, that gave the most amazing thing of all. From the 118th floor, they gave a breathtaking view over Victoria Harbour and the tall glass modern skyscrapers of Hong Kong. The light was beginning to fade outside as sunset approached. The illuminations were just becoming visible. Wow, that is some view, I exclaimed. We are so high up. It's like looking from the windows of an aeroplane. No wonder we felt funny coming up in the lift, Jeff said. Come on, let's look outside on the outdoor terrace, and then we should get a drink. We need to blend in. We looked out over the edge of the building at the little boats that were travelling up and down and across the waterway. We were so high up that my brain was unable to understand what it was seeing. This meant that I didn't feel at all frightened by the deep drop beneath me, just fascinated by what I could see. Flat bright? Jeff asked me as we approached the bar. Um, have they got anything else, like meat-infused water, perhaps? With ice, please. I'm feeling posh. I answered, looking around for a seat. I'll go and sit over here. This way, we can see the door when they come in. But that pillar will hide us. OK, see you there, replied Jeff, as he waited for the drinks to be poured. I jumped up onto the seat and waited for him to come over. This is a good spot that you chose, Jeff said, putting our drinks down on the table, mine in a wide silver dish, so that I could easily lap it up. They will be here in a minute. Gizmo said sunset was at half past six. The bar wasn't crowded, but there was a variety of different customers. Most were tourists who had come up for the awe-inspiring experience. There was a red setter, clearly exhausted by the whole thing, curled up and asleep in a chair. His people, a man, a lady and three children, sipped drinks and shared a bowl of coloured ice cream scoops. The red setter woke up at the clink of spoons against the bowl, as indeed would I. When the group of criminals came into the bar and wonderfully took their seats that were just on the other side of the pillar, we hardly noticed them. They all looked so ordinary. A large man in a suit and dark glasses with a fierce black Doberman pincher entered first. They are here for security, I thought. Next came a bald businessman in a light blue suit. He accompanied a smart, pretty lady dog, a white, fluffy Bichon Frise. 
They were all respect, respectably dressed and groomed, talking politely. They sat down at their table. Had it not been for the Italian greyhound and the big hairy dog with them, we would not have thought anything was suspicious. Jeff casually took the spy phone out and pressed the red go button to start recording. I knew that I needed to look relaxed and not nervous, but I felt that I wanted to just run away. I realised again that I couldn't just run home, even if I had the chance. The criminal gathering all sat around our marble-topped table. The dogs were sitting up on chairs with their front legs straight in front of them, and the humans were confidently lounging back, all facing each other. Well, said the high Italian-voiced Carlos Fandango, having lapped from his silver bowl in front of him. I'll start with the talk and say, ha ha, why, why are you called this a meeting? And when you are going to pay for us our successful job? He directed this to the Lady Fri Bijon Fries. Not so fast, she said slowly and calmly, raising her paw as a signal to stop. That's how we do business around here. We like to have certain polite pleasantries and chat first. It keeps everything civilised. Oh, and no, continued the Italian greyhound. I did not fly halfway around the world to waste time on pleasantries. Let's get with it. The smartly dressed businessman, who accompanied the Bijon, spoke for the first time. He smiled continuously with a fixed artificial grin. Although he looked Chinese, his accent was very confidently American. Now, what Princess Jam means, he said gesturing to the Bijon, is that we all need to be very sure of our positions before we continue. It's so we know why we are all here and what we all want from the meeting. He rubbed his hand over his bald head. Hmm, see, si, agreed Carlos. Well, I have kept my side of the bargain. I have organized the destruction of vast amounts of chocolate in the UK, with lots of chocolate shops raided. I have also started the distribution of your uh, cheap alternative, so the people can get hooked on that instead. The great Gabba owes me a lot of money. <laughs> Very well, said Princess Jem. You will get some of your money. This job isn't finished yet. The chocolate shops will soon recover, and we need to know that the chocolate business in the UK is closed down permanently. You must organise more raids, and keep on raiding until our own bar, Chocky Yum, is the only chocolate bought in the UK. That's easy, boss, growled Boris. We can just keep sending the gangs out on their stolen mobility scooters, and tell them they're going to, the work, going to do, doing the work of the Great Gabba. They love it. Yes, as long as you keep paying us, but we cannot do this forever, said Carlos. I thought that uh, the price agreed was just for one job. Who is this great gabber anyway? And why isn't he here? What has he got against chocolate? Ah, yes, said Princess Jem gently. Lots of questions, quite understandable. Mr. Yan, please explain for our guests. Where shall I start? Asked the smartly dressed man, leaning forward in his seat. First, the great gabber. The great gabber will never come to meet you. He is too great. He lives on the island of Bolho in the Philippines and never leaves. He has endless reserves of money and only wants to use it for good, you see, continued the man after taking a sip of his drink and looking around the table. Cacao plants, which, for, uh, from which all chocolate is made, have a great, uh, quite a rare position on the globe. They only grow in particular places, in the tropics of the world, where temperature, humidity and rainfall all stay the same throughout the year. The Philippines, where we find the island of Bolho, is quite new to cacao growing and only started in the 1980s. Now, it is the third leading producer of cocoa beans. It is a growing business. There is more money and more people coming to the Great Gabba's Island. The man stopped for, ever, for everyone to take in this information. And surely this is a good thing. Do people of Bo Boho, they just, they must love it. Carlos asked, now interested. Yes, the people do, Mr. Yan said firmly. For the Great Gabba, though, this is a bad thing. He does not want people or their money coming to and taking over his beautiful chocolate hills or poaching endangered animals. Global warming and climate change are caused by humans. It is affecting all animals. It cannot be stopped. Boho is one of the important cocoa-growing places that's now becoming very important. The Great Gabba wants people to stop eating chocolate and start eating his Chucky Yum Bars. His great work has started in the UK. It is one of the places in the world where most chocolate is eaten. But won't people still want the chocolate? Carlos asked. No, Mr. Yan replied. Chucky Yum might not taste as good as chocolate, but it has a special ingredient, making it very addictive. And to begin with, Princess Jem continued, pausing to stick out her pink tongue and lick her nose, it will be very cheap. As soon as you've organised for it to be impossible to buy real chocolate again, we will put the price up and be very rich. Chocky Yum is very cheap for us to make too. She put out a paw to her big security guard and he reached inside his jacket pocket, producing a Chocky Yum bar. He put it down on the table. I glanced across at the table from behind the pillar to see the bar. It was just like the ones we saw at the airport. It's green and orange striped wrapper with the big black letters across the front saying Chalky Yum now seemed quite scary, having heard more about it. Chalky Yum has no nutritional value, said Mr. Yum. It will not fill you up. 
It doesn't taste particularly great, just a bit chocolatey, but it's very addictive. It's just full of chemicals, special addictive chemicals that once tasted, people just want more and more of. Would you like to try some? I wouldn't recommend it. No, thanks, shouted Boris. Sounds rubbish. Oh, it is, agreed Princess Jem, but it will make us rich, as long as you do as we ask. And of course, all of your gangs keep following the wishes of the great Gabba, risking their own health, poor things, all in the hope of a better life. <laughs> Fools. This great Gabba story has worked so far, it seems. <laughs> she giggled. You mean the great Gabba doesn't really exist? Carlos asked, sounding a little puzzled. puzzled. Well, said Princess Jem, smiling and glancing across at Mr. Yan, this version of an Indonesian traditional story does. There perhaps once was a great Gabba, but when we heard of it, we used his story. We changed it so that we can control other weak animals. It suits our purposes. Now I insist that you both try a little bit of chalky yum. It is important to know what you're selling. Carlos and Boris looked alarmed and were about to protest, but Princess Jem continued. Now don't worry about becoming addicted, because here is the antidote. She looked over to Mr. Yan, who raised his hand in a signal to the barman. The barman quickly brought a tray with a single glass of dark brown liquid over to the table. He then gave a little bow and went back to the bar again. Yuck, Boris exclaimed. That looks grim, Mr. Yan said. Once you've tasted Chucky Yum, you will instantly want more and more. One sip of this, however, and you will be cured. It's just prune juice. Plain and simple prune juice. It's an easy cure, but a complete secret. Not many people drink prune juice, so they are not going to discover it. Hmm, Carlos said doubtfully. Okay then, break off a bit. Let's try it. Boris, eat it, he ordered. Boris opened his mouth and tipped his head back. Mr. Yan broke off a little piece and threw it up across the table, and Boris caught it in his mouth. In a second, he had swallowed it. They all waited to see what would happen. Blimey, Boris said. It's really bad. It's a bit chocolatey, I suppose. Just chemicals, you say? Hmm, actually, it's not bad at all. In fact, could I have just a bit more? Or maybe not just a bit? Maybe just give me the whole bar. In fact, Boris demanded quite forcefully now, G give me the whole bar now. I, I want it. Give it to me. He stood in his seat and leaned forward aggressively. The security dog stiffened, but waited for orders before he attacked. Boris was sounding quite vicious now and was about to jump down from his seat to take the bar of Chalky Yum. Stop, ordered Carlos. Stop at once, Boris. Now look, Mr. Yan is coming, to to coming around to you to pour a little of the prune juice down your throat. So open wide. As soon as the prune juice had been administered to, by Mr. Yan, Boris instantly calmed down. He could visibly be seen to relax back into his chair, and he sighed contentedly. Well, I'm a pre impressed, Carlos admitted. Molto impressionato. In fact, a great demonstration, but it is something important that has me confused. If Chucky Yam is so addictive, why did we all do chocolate raids? Couldn't you have just started selling Chucky Yam? People would soon be hooked on it. That is true, agreed Princess Jem, nodding slowly. But we needed to have the chocolate raids to start the whole thing off. I know that Chocky Yum is very addictive and very cheap, but it doesn't taste that good. Most people won't even try a chocolate-flavoured candy bar to start with if they could eat, get hold of affordable real chocolate. Everyone in the group gently nodded as they all understood this. Secondly, your earlier point was right. The chocolate raids will not go on forever, and eventually the chocolate production will recover. We have to ensure that people don't just go back to eating normal, proper chocolate again. After all, it tastes much better than Chocky Yum. All of the criminals smiled around at each other. Concordato, said Carlos in Italian, jumping down from his chair and coming over to lick Mr. Yan and Princess Jam on the cheeks. I agree with your plan. Yet their security man and dog stiffened up again, wondering what he was doing. It sounded like a great plan, so let's shake on it. Now send me the money, and we are all systems go. I will do anything for money if the price is right. You must send it all now. <laughs> we have just sent the first instalment, said Princess Jem softly. We have started selling Chalky Yum as well in airports. We just needed to make sure of your commitment to our project. However, I really would recommend that you turn around and look at the light show. Jeff and I turned around too. It was quite dark now. All the tall skyscrapers along the bank of Hong Kong's Victoria Harbour were lit up in an amazing display of lights and laser beams. The buildings flashed and pulsed with moving illuminations and bright lasers crisscrossed in the velvety dark sky. As I sat in my seat and scratched at my fur, I thought about what I'd just heard. All done in the name of the great Gabba. It was easy to dismiss all this simply as an idea just to make money from selling cheap fake chocolate. But I thought there must be more to it. I said this to Jeff. They seem to say that the great Gabba isn't real. I'm not sure, though. All the animals in Britain seem quite convinced that he is real. I agree with you, Ned, Jeff said, turning briefly from looking at the lights. Well, you know what we need to do now, then, don't you? 
What? I asked, also mesmerised by the flashing brightness across the harbour. We need to meet the great Gabba and find out what this is all about. Let's try to follow these new, these two new criminals, because I bet they are going back to meet him. We turned to where the party of criminals had been sitting. Their table was empty. Whilst we had been watching the light show, they had disappeared. And that is where we will leave part seven of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis. I will be back soon with part eight of this fascinating story and lots more coming your way as well. Lots of stories, lots of videos. If you'd like to subscribe to my channel, that's always appreciated. And if you want to hit a like, that's even better. Thanks for your support, guys. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.